The man was a Greek citizen, and as a little boy, his town was invaded by people across the, the straits, the narrow waters that between Greece and Eastern Europe. The invading army invaded his town, shot all the leaders so they could have complete control, and his father was one of them. And not wanting his wife to make any trouble, they beat the bottoms of her feet into two blistering, bloody stumps so she could go nowhere. She went anyway. She took her three children, walked, ran, walked, ran through the woods, through the plains, as far as she could possibly go, far outside the influence of the army that had taken possession of the town. She could go no further. She instructed her children to keep going and go to what they knew would be a safe house where a relative was living. They did. She lay down in the grass and breathed her last. They got to the relative's house and eventually were sent to America with a Greek, Greek community where they were raised and turned into wonderful young adults. When he was 21, the man bought a gun. He traveled back to Greece when luggage, when luggage inspections were not as rigid as they are today. He took his gun to the town, intending to pay back these people who collaborated with the enemy and enabled them to kill the leaders and kill his mother eventually. He only found one. So he went to the man's house and found him dozing in the backyard. He walked softly up to him, placed the gun near the temple of his head, cocked it, whispered, didn't whisper, said aloud his family's name. The man stiffened and then began to tremble. The young man then paused. He uncocked the gun, let his hand drop, and walked away. What he had been nurturing in his heart since he was a little boy, revenge on these people who had killed his mother and his father, revenge that had caused her all that suffering, now seemed to be so useless. In fact, it seemed to be just a repetition of the same thing they did to his parents. When he saw the futility of what he was involved in, he came back to the United States, dedicated his life to the memory of his mother, part of which was writing his story. Now, my brothers and sisters, if someone had done that for you, I'm sure you would have dedicated your life to that person. Now the reading. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to feel sorrow and distress. Then he said to them, my soul is sorrowful even unto death. Remain here and keep watch with me. He advanced a little and fell prostrate in prayer, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. 
yet not as I will, but as you will. When he returned to his disciples, he found them asleep. He said to Peter, so you could not keep watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not undergo the test. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Withdrawing a second time, he prayed again, My father, if it is not possible that this cup pass without my drinking it, your will be done. Then he returned once more and found them asleep, for they could not keep their eyes open. He left them and withdrew again and prayed a third time, saying the same thing again. Then he returned to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Behold, the hour is at hand when the Son of Man is to be handed over to sinners. Get up, let us go. Look, my betrayer is at hand. While they were still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, accompanied by a large crowd with swords and clubs, who had come from the chief priests and the elders of the people. His betrayer had arranged a sign with them, saying, the man I shall kiss is the one. Arrest him. Immediately he went over to Jesus and said, Hail Rabbi, and he kissed him. Jesus answered him, Friend, do what you have come to do. Then stepping forward, they laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. And behold, one of those who accompanied Jesus put his hand to his sword, drew it, and struck the high priest's servant cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back in its sheath, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot call upon my Father and he will not provide me at this moment with more than twelve legions of angels? But then how would the scriptures be fulfilled, which say that it must come to pass in this way? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to seize me? Day after day I sat teaching in the temple area, yet you did not arrest me. But all this has come to pass, that the writings of the prophets may be fulfilled. My brothers and sisters, the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. I am sure you would have dedicated your life had your parents died in such a cruel and dramatic way. I am sure that just for your protection, if she or he or both did these things, you would be eternally grateful that someone could give his life for you while well, someone had. Someone has. And that someone is the Son of God, Jesus Christ. The mother who walked that heroic mile or two miles or however long it was, was able to do that in intense pain because she loved. That's what love does. It transforms us. It makes us capable of doing what we never thought we could do or aspiring to something we thought was completely unreachable for us. We are capable because we love. And love demands sacrifice and pain. Look at the life of Jesus, love itself. When Jesus gave his life for us, at first, as we read, he was scared. He experienced all human emotions, and fear was certainly one of them, although this seems to be the only time in his life that he was truly afraid. 
His fear eventually gave way to a certain calm. And then a determination. And then the courage to face his enemy. Jesus could have escaped out a back path in the Gethsemane into the desert and no one would have ever found him again. He didn't go there. He faced his fate. Jesus suffered all this because he loved. Jesus suffered all this because he loved and loves you. 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 Each and every one of you and me and us. And he loves you with the same love that he loves Mother Teresa with. Do we really acknowledge that love? If we really appreciated, if we really appreciated it, we would dedicate our lives to Jesus Christ. If we really knew the tender feelings he had for all the people, even his persecutors, if we really knew the sorrow that invaded his house, his home, his person, because of their rejection of him. We would understand what he was undergoing. And like so many before us, it would bring us to tears. This is a beautiful crucifix. I bought this in a religious goods store in August of some year I forget because all crucifixes in this store were being sold for half price. I went into the store and I looked for where the crucifixes were. They were all sitting in one group and it said 50% off. They were all made of plastic. I said, I don't want a plastic cross, I want a real cross. So I started walking out of the store and I saw on a pillar that was covered with rug, like the rug on the floor, this cross and another one like it hanging there. But it wasn't with the others, but it said all crucifixes. So I went to the lady at the counter and I said, all crucifixes on sale for 50%? She said, yes, Father. I said, what about that one over there? And she turned around and looked at it. She said, oh, I don't know. I said, well, could you find out for me? She said, yes, I'll go back and ask the owner. So she went into the back room and stayed there for a long time. When she came out, she still found me standing there. It just so happened that a couple of people had already given me certificates, gift certificates for the shop. And I had, I guess, about $30 or $35 worth of gift certificates. This list price on this said, handmade in Germany, $120. I didn't have one. So the man came out and he said, yeah, Father, they're all on sale for 50%. <laughs> and I said, good. I said, that brings it down to 60. And with these, I owe you $20. <laughs> he said, that's right. A generous moment on his part. And it's a beautiful crucifix, is it not? Look at how the archway goes over the top, matching the arch on the body. Right away you get a feeling of artistic symmetry. Look at how perfect the body is formed. And how clean and outstretched and graceful even the loincloth is flaring in the wind. 
as beautiful as this is, and as much as I love it, it is nothing like the reality. Nothing like the reality. The first place the Romans looked for when they occupied a country or a region or a state or whatever was a place to do their crucifixions because they wanted to horrify these people. They wanted to make sure they understood the horror they would be feeling and experiencing if they caused disorder, disobeyed the laws. Crucifixion was torturous. Why was it torturous? Someone die from loss of blood? No. Did someone die because, I don't know, some other reason? No. When you were crucified, you died by suffocation. How can that be? Well, you see, the arch-stretched arms, which are probably closer to the pole, eventually begin to pull, your body pulls away from them which can strip your chest muscles. And with every breath, it becomes harder to breathe. Some people take a long time to die by crucifixion. Jesus' time seems to have been relatively short, but he was very badly beaten before he got there. And probably was already weak with the loss of blood. So when they came to him, they didn't have to break his legs and make the suffering and the suffocation so much that finally the person couldn't breathe at all. He was already dead. My brothers and sisters, Jesus knew what he was in for when he faced the soldiers and the crowd. He knew that by standing up to them and declaring what he was all about, when he did so, when he cleansed the, tents, the temple, he knew he was a marked man. And the temple had a Roman garrison right nearby, which they just discovered, the archaeologists. And the Romans were watching. And don't think they weren't, because they were always looking for the possibility of rioting, disorder, whatever. So it didn't reach the climax that it had to reach before the soldiers invaded, but they knew who he was and what he was doing. So when the chance came to tie him up, bring him back, they did it. My brothers and sisters, this is God's act of love, very similar to that woman who gave her life for her children. I'm sure when that woman lay down in the grass to breathe her last, she was filled with joy because she had saved the lives of her three children whom she had brought into the world. And she had served the God who brought her into the world. And she knew that her heroic work would gain her eternal peace in the world to come. And the children never forgot. Now, do we forget If Jesus went through all this for you, do you forget? Before this falls again, I'm going to put it down. Do we forget? In our culture, my brothers and sisters, it's so easy to forget. And why? Because we have so many distractions. Distractions from what? 
Distractions from our inner selves, where God dwells, where God dwells. The indwelling of God in every one of us is a article of faith in Christianity and Catholicism. The indwelling of God. St. Paul tells his people, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? I wonder if the practices we see on TV or in almost anywhere, anyone could say that these bodies are reflecting the presence of the Holy Spirit within them. And we see it every day. The sacred is giving way to the profane. And as a culture, we are part of that. My brothers and sisters, to stand up for Christ means to have a cross. The cross might be anything from declaring your faith to suffering for it. Persecution stripped of your rights, standing up for an innocent man or woman, anything that requires heroism takes internal strength to stand alone, be unafraid. I shouldn't say unafraid because Jesus Christ was afraid, you heard it, but he did it. He calmed down. And he turned around and faced his fate. And to him at that point it must have been a joy. Because he knew he was carrying out his father's will. And come the resurrection he would keep those signs on his flesh. He kept his wounds. To remind himself and others that he had carried out his father's will. And his father's will was to show how much God loves us, loves us. I'm not up here commanding your fear because you sin. I'm up here trying to command your admiration for God who has done so much for you. The only prayer that we can pray that makes sense is thanksgiving. And that's what the Eucharist is called. That's what it means in Greek. Thanksgiving. For what? For what God has done for us. Your parents could have only wanted a baby. God wanted you to be that baby when you were existed, when you began your existence. And your mother and father raised you, not knowing who you were going to be, but God knew each one of you and me. And God's personal love for you, personal love for you, is so evident and so clear that it makes you wonder sometimes whether we're really worth it. Jesus would reprimand me for saying such a thing because he sees you as being so very precious. So my brothers and sisters, we should avoid sin because we're missing out on God's love. We should lead life of prayer because there's so much to benefit from it. Joy in all these things is one of the greatest benefits. Please remember this if you remember nothing else. Joy is the only infallible sign of God's presence. It's not asceticism. It's not regularity. It's not whatever you want to make it the only infallible sign of God's presence is joy. Amid their sufferings, people can experience joy.
joy. There was a woman who wrote a book who never got to publish it, but gave it to someone in the concentration camp to see if after she died it might be published. Her name was Edie Hillison. She was a Jew. She practiced contemplative prayer being taught by another Jew who was a psychiatrist. But they were all packed away in Holland in the central concentration camp where she was made a nurse because she had an unusual rapport with everyone. But she had been practicing contemplative prayer and had been in touch with God. She did not want a priest. She did not reject her Jewishness. She did not have a church to belong to. She did not want to be baptized. But she writes in her book, as she walked through the liberty that she had as a nurse in the concentration camp, she wrote, in this God-forsaken place, I feel tears of joy running down my cheeks. Joy, joy. That's what we are in for, joy, God's joy. My brothers and sisters, tomorrow we talk about the Holy Spirit. We talk about the sacraments. We talk about the Eucharist. We talk about forgiveness. And one big thing to remember, because it's so key to joy, is that joy and forgiveness are exactly the same thing. If there is no joy, excuse me, love and forgiveness, excuse me, love and forgiveness are exactly the same thing. If there's no love, there's no forgiveness. If there's no forgiveness, there's no love. It's as simple as that. So Jesus came down to give his life for you, but also for the ones who persecuted him and crucified him. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I can't even imagine somebody doing that. My brothers and sisters, we have so much to be grateful for. We haven't been, let us begin that today.